Okay, I'm Rick Fleeter, and um, to talk about the future of microspace, um, I thought it would be easier to, rather than just try to figure out what the future of microspace would be, to partly extrapolate from what the past of microspace has been, since we have uh, a little bit more than 50 years of that now, 55 years or so of microspace. Um, I titled the talk 100 Years in Microspace, figuring, well, we got 55, 57 years behind us, and maybe 43 years of prediction into the future would be more sufficient, <laughs> probably way beyond what a person can really, can really predict about the future in space because it's so hard to know what other factors, what's going to change people's minds about what they want to do, could have more of an effect than what technologically we're capable of doing in the future. But, um, so I titled, subtitled the talk 1957 to 2057. So let's look just in a couple of slides, not to belabor that point, but it is kind of interesting to look at the fact that the very first satellite, the very first uh, synthetic satellite with Sputnik weighed 84 kilograms. Most of that 84 kilograms was batteries because Sputnik didn't have uh, solar panels. So it lasted as long as the batteries lasted. So the idea was how big of a thing can you launch how small can you make the electronics? The rest of it has to be all batteries. And that was the story of Sputnik. It was an unstabilized satellite with a variety of radio antennas, which was sort of its signature shape, the sphere with the multiple antennas. Virtually immediately after that, in January of 1958, the Americans launched Explorer. And Explorer was much lighter, but it also wasn't dominated totally by batteries. It was 14 kilograms. So now, you know, nowadays, we talk about small satellites, we're basically talking about the range of 1 to 100 kilograms. It's exactly where the very first satellites were. So in a way, this rediscovery of small satellites, you could almost look at it as a return to the past. Though, um, well, that's one way to look at it. The very first satellites were, in fact, small satellites. And in fact, they were built with technologies very similar in the sense that the strategy of building them in a small team, and obviously they were using terrestrial components. There were no other components. So it's like my father said to me once about organic food, because now we live in a world where every place you go, there's organic supermarkets. And he said, you know, I never thought about it, but growing up in the 30s, we didn't have anything other than organic supermarkets because there were no pesticides. So everything was organic. We just didn't appreciate it. So in a way, when we were building satellites in the 50s and 60s, everything was a small satellite, but we didn't appreciate it because we hadn't managed to build the big ones yet. But the interesting, going on with that slide, um, and I talked before about the big three, communications, um, science, and remote sensing, they were basically all proven in that first five years of, of satellite operation, or seven. And the radio amateur guys got into small satellites very, very early. I mean, December of 61 was the launch of the first Oscar, the orbiting satellite carrying amateur radio, which was a radio uh, transponder satellite. And I got into uh, small satellites through AMSAT, which up until uh, when I was there in the 70s and 80s, was pretty much a small satellite organization. And um, so that was really the, the, the interesting thing, as I said, about those early ones. If you look at the capability, the original thrust of space was, can we do these things? It's like being a little kid. You want to prove to yourself you can ride a bicycle, you can skate. You can, your first attempt is not to be a world-class skier, but just to see if you can get down the mountain without killing yourself. And that's like what we were doing in space. We proved that we could do Earth imaging. I have a picture here, not to say these were the first. I'm not a space historian. But of Explorer in 1959 did Earth imaging. And of course, the Oscar satellites were low Earth orbit transponders, just providing reflecting uh, amateur radio signals back to the ground. The very first um, geosynchronous telecom satellite was SYNCOM, and that was um, in 1964. So it's really talking about a long way back to have demonstrated the very basic principles, which we kind of prove to ourselves, yes, I can do this, yes, I can do this. Then we have the phase of what I call a few distractions, when really the world became enamorated in, with very big satellites. And those took the form, initially, the, the big thrust in satellites, we think of as being the manned missions, the crewed missions like Apollo, and of course, all the Russian robotic missions to the moon, which launched similar masses of material to the surface uh, of the moon. And then, of course, the space shuttle and later on the space station. And also the geosynchronous communication satellites, which are mostly very big satellites in the 5,000 kilogram range. And they generated the need for much larger launch vehicles. And so the space industry sort of bootstraps itself 
from very small launch vehicles that could launch a few kilograms, tens of kilograms, to very launch, large launch vehicles that could launch several uh, metric tons into orbit. And um, I think one of the, you know, one of the things I look at when I think about that is why did we do that? You know, why did we go to very big satellites? And some of the reasons are not that relevant anymore. Some of them are, of course, still relevant because if you want to have a very large, if you want to land people on the moon, if you want to do anything with people, you automatically have a large mission, both in terms of size and in terms of the criterion I was talking about before, which is takes a lot of people. Six people do not build a, a, a mission with live human crews in it that do, does anything. You're talking about enormous organizations to handle the sheer size of the undertaking and all the life support systems and communications and safety and et cetera. It's not a small satellite mission by definition. And yet in the 60s, if you wanted to launch a highly capable computer and actuator into space, the very best, lightest, smallest payload you could possibly think of was a human being. And so in a way, it was the lack of the computer technology that we have today that drove us to make missions big enough to house a human being so that we could have a, an intelligent something taking pictures in space, doing control functions in space, and just basically doing many of the things that we can now do without having a human in space. So that was one of the motivations. Another motivation was defense and was the rise of the intercontinental ballistic missile, which required a missile, a rocket of a certain size. And that became, in a way, a background motivation for Apollo which was in the process of building Apollo, you had to get really good at building very big rockets. And that's exactly what the Department of Defense of the US wanted to do anyway, and probably the Russians also, though I know less about the Soviet Union. And so there was another agenda at work to space was considered the next frontier of war front and to be dominant in that field. So it really had nothing to do with do we like big satellites or small satellites. It was more of a, what was perceived as a survival imperative by the, and I think that still happens, the need of large powers to have space in their arsenal of technologies is because they want space in their arsenal of weaponry also. So those things contributed to driving, and some of those have not gone away. We still want to have human missions, and we still talk about humans uh, in the, on the space station, of course, but also on the moon or on Mars, which are by definition large missions. But many other motivations to do large satellites are not really relevant anymore. The idea of us needing to build ever bigger rockets to prove that we're more powerful than another nation is really not an operative concept anymore. And the idea that we need humans in space because we don't have robots and we don't have computers is a little bit ridiculous. And, and so humans, in a way, become passengers on the spacecraft who do interesting things, but the spacecraft is basically an autonomous thing, and the human role in it is to be there to do other things that humans do, not to fly it or not to be because we don't have a computer that's capable of doing what they can do. Okay, so in a nutshell, what's the difference between big missions and small missions? One of the differences is the team size. That small satellites are developed by small interactive teams. Large satellites are built by large, relatively rigid teams that are divided according to a formalized org chart, which makes the organization of many thousands of people possible and really, if you're going to run many kinds of organizations, you need that org chart. We don't have a human technology better for organizing large numbers of people than that hierarchical org chart, which is a little sad when you think about that that hierarchical org chart has been around for 10,000 years, and we haven't been able to do better than that. Of course, we're still running on the same human operating system we were running on 10,000 years ago, so maybe it's no surprise that since we haven't upgraded our software, Everything about it looks about the same as it did back then. But in any case, that <laughs> we have the same organization that, that was used to make wars you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. And that was about the main application for organizing very large numbers of people at that time. And it was in the 40s and 50s that the science of management became recognized as a science and that we started building things that were so big and complicated that no one person understood how it all worked and that's the story of, for instance, the space shuttle. There's no one person who understood how it worked, or the space station for that matter, or really any large space mission. In fact, that's one of the things that's valuable as a space missions. It forces us to learn to manage things that are incredibly large and complicated. So I never want to come off as sounding like Rick is like the zealot about small satellites, that I don't see the value in large missions. In many ways, they stress the boundaries of what we're capable of doing as human beings. 
But in the small satellite, we organize more as, uh, as a sports team where every member communicates with every other member at every moment, can make trade-offs in real time of what's the best solution to their problem, change their mind, and immediately reverberate through the organization what all the implications of that change in your mind would be, and therefore come to a decision in the course of a conversation whether we go with a new processor, whether we go with a new deployment mechanism, whether we change the configuration or the chemistry of the batteries or whatever it is, and go on from there. Whereas in a big program, once the review has locked in the design, your job becomes to buy those parts and build that design regardless of, of the bumps that may appear in the road, like many of those parts not becoming available or realizing that that wasn't really the best solution. After all, it's too bad. You can do that on version six of the satellite, but not on the current version that you're working on right now. So that's a kind of an obvious set of differences. Um, the less obvious set of differences has to do with the reliability and the fact that as you scale up, the failure of parts becomes the driver for reliability because the probability of failure of a 99.99% reliable part is 0.001. But the probability of a failure if you have a collection of 1,000 of those parts is 1%. And if you have a collection of a million of those parts, I mean, you're virtually guaranteed to have parts failures in orbit. So large satellites are built with that philosophy in mind. Get the most reliable parts you can and then assume they're going to fail on orbit and figure out how you're going to have various levels of redundancy to keep that from happening. Whereas a small satellite may be built with a handful, relatively 10 to 100 active components on board, and the chances of them failing are very, very small. So our reliability problem becomes different. That reliability problem, I have a little picture of ENIAC, which was one of the very early vacuum tube computers. And what was the problem with ENIAC? Why couldn't we make ENIAC? any more powerful. And in fact, there were designs to make ENIAC more powerful. In fact, what they did was they doubled the number of vacuum tubes that ENIAC had in it, which I think went from a number, a crazy number of vacuum tubes, like 100,000, to an even crazier number, like 200,000. The idea was that you could calculate twice as fast. So you'd have an ENIAC that was twice as powerful, the ENIAC 2, twice as powerful as the ENIAC 1. The problem was, what was the limiter of ENIAC 1 was that you would start doing a calculation and one of those 100,000 vacuum tubes would fail. So that would cease the calculation and that length of time, the mean time between failures, constituted the limit on how complicated of a problem any act one could do. So we doubled the number of vacuum tubes to run the computer twice as fast, but the mean time between failure was half as long. So the net calculation, no matter how many, how you do it, if your basic technology is vacuum tubes, there's a limit you could call it the ENIAC limit, to how much calculation you can accomplish before the computer fails, and then the calculation has to be repeated. So if you say, what's the difference? What made microsatellites happen? That's part of what made microsatellites happen, because when you buy a microprocessor chip that has 10 million onboard components, that counts as one component. Whereas if you had to wire that up out of transistors, capacitors, resistors, the reliability would be so low that you'd never be able to fly that in space, but as a microprocessor, the reliability is so high that you don't have to worry about it failing in space. So one of the enabling technologies for modern microsatellites was the microprocessor and all the miniaturization of electronics that allowed us to build a fairly complex functionality in space with 10 components or with 100 components. Of course, buried inside of those components are millions and millions of active, but they don't count in the reliability that microprocessor has its reliability, 99.99%. And we leverage that like crazy in the small satellite world, saying, hey, I can do all this with you know, three chips. So in that case, reliability is not your limiter in, in, in building small satellites, which is a fantastic freedom. OK, then I have a couple of slides here that I named after the Neil Young song, Rust Never Sleeps. And nobody ever understands why I call it that. But that's because nobody ever understood why he titled, and I still don't know why he titled a song and then an album, Rust Never Sleeps. But I have my own interpretation, which is that these old ideas are always out there, right? And we're sometimes conscious of them, but we're not. We went through a period, at least in American and European space, where small space was totally forgotten. The only people practicing it were a few of us amateur guys building satellites in garages in California and stuff like that. And the rest of the world was relatively unconscious of small satellites' existence. And then when I got on the 
you know, on the road and tried to re, you know, reignite this, given all the new technologies that we had in this reliability breakthrough that was allowed by the microprocessor. I mean, most people call that a performance breakthrough, that you could do all this on a single chip. To me, it was a reliability breakthrough, because one chip has a certain reliability instead of 10 million discrete pieces, right? But anyway, what they didn't realize, and what these two slides have on them, is a list of all the microsatellites that happened when supposedly we were all asleep. We weren't asleep. We were building little satellites all along, but the attention of society was on Apollo, Skylab, and Muir, and then the, sh the shuttle, and then the space station. And it only was at a certain point in all that when we started paying attention again for various reasons, turnaround time being one of them making satellites fast enough to be relevant to uh, space science applications, to technology applications, where you could get your idea in space in a year and a half, and then budget. There just wasn't the budget to just go and build all the stuff that we had the luxury of building in the 60s. And people started looking. The US government, as one of uh, the customers of my company, started looking for people who could do it for less. And, and I specifically remember a very important proposal that we wrote, and we won it against Boeing. And Boeing had all the credibility in the world, but our price was 5 to 7% of Boeing's price. And I, I think that was the only reason we won. I think the customer really wanted to give the contract to Boeing. They trusted them. Boeing has you know, a million years' experience in space, and who is Rick Fleeter and Aero Astro? But the price was compelling because they just couldn't afford to keep doing business the way they'd always been doing business. And that was really, I mean, sadly enough, we'd like to think we were just smart guys, but I think part of what drove the reawakening of microspace was um, uh, nobody had the budget to do it the way they actually wanted to do it. And we were considered, I used to call my company, Aero Astro, the satellite builder of last resort. When you can't afford a satellite from Lockheed, you might go to Ball. If you can't afford a satellite from Ball, you might go to someone like Orbital Sciences. And if you can't even afford a satellite from Orbital Sciences, you either give up altogether, you go to Rick Fleeter and take your chances, right? So we were the satellite builder of last resort. And luckily, when people get desperate enough, rather than giving up going to space altogether, it generated a lot of business for us. And that was really, I don't credit myself with the success of Aeroastro so much as bad times on the part of the Air Force Research Rocket Propulsion Lab, you know, the, the, the basic backbone of our business, and also NASA, looking for new ways to keep pushing their agenda forward without spending the amount of money they were spending before. So us rusty guys who were never sleeping were actually ready to step in when all of a sudden there were other contingencies. Launch space became available on the shuttle. There was less money available. And these guys, hey, we were building small satellites, so we were like rediscovered. It was excellent. OK, so next slide is an old slide that surveyed the amateur satellites that were built from 1961 to 2010, 40 years during this prehistoric period in small satellites. And OK, it's impossible to collect these statistics. I do probably too superficial of a job, but we launched more than 70 amateur radio satellites in those, which is already an amazing number, 70 satellites in 40 years from basically two amateur radio organizations. You know, well, okay. I mean, within Europe, let's say three, because the whole European amateur radio satellite scene altogether might constitute one. The English one, which was basically Surrey, would be another. And then the American one, AMSAT US, which I was a member of and I became uh, the head of engineering for them for a very short time. Um, and I'll tell you why I became the head of engineering for them. Because it was all electrical engineers. And all of a sudden, it dawned on them that most of the problems that they were facing were not electrical engineering. They wanted propulsion. They wanted deployable structures. And they wanted stabilization and control. And those are not things that normally electrical engineers learn to do. And I happened to, those were my areas. So particularly propulsion and stabilization and control. So it was like a new wave in AMSAT. It was when AMSAT was trying to do more than just launch electronic boxes with solar panels on them that didn't point and didn't do anything in terms of propulsion. And they really wanted to choose orbits and make orbit transfer maneuvers and point the satellites and so on. So my coming into the organization at, at an executive level at that time was really for that reason. The interesting thing about these 70 satellites, OK, I don't know AMSAT UK, and I don't know the AMSAT Italy and uh, you know, the other countries in Europe. 
as well as I know AMSAT US, because I built satellites for AMSAT US. And how do we build them? We, various people would volunteer to build one of the boxes, okay? One guy would volunteer to build the transmitter, okay? And my job, part of my job, was to travel around the country and check in with these people. They were doing it out of the goodness of their heart with whatever tools they had available, and they were usually fairly competent ham radio people. So I distinctly remember one night going to the house of one of these guys someplace in the Midwest, and I think I coupled it with a visit to my family back in Ohio, and he invited me over for, it was the evening, he'd been at work during the day, he invited me over for dinner, and we had dinner, and he said, okay, so do you want to see the radio I'm building for your satellite? And I said, yeah, and I said, do you, like, do you have a shop, or where do you work on this radio? He said, no, after dinner we clear off the table, and you know, like a wood kitchen table, and then he pulls the satellite out of a kitchen drawer, I mean the box, the radio box for the satellite, a bunch of soldering tools, and a little, he had a mat, actually, you know, like an anti-static mat, and that was the radio. And we're talking about a non-redundant, that was the only transmitter on board the satellite. And this guy, was he like, you know, a MIT PhD electric? No, I mean, the guy was not even involved in engineering during the day. He had some job, insurance job, or uh, administrative job. And his hobby was ham radio, and he knew how to build radios. He'd learned it in ham radio since he was a little kid. And he was building this radio. And that was our radio. Okay, then how do we test those radios? We bolted those radios onto the bumpers of cars, four-wheel drive cars, we had them back then, and we drove them off-road, because we didn't have a vibration chain. We just drove the car on the beach in California, or off-road in a trail, and if it survived, you know, half an hour, an hour of that, we'd unbolt it from the bumper of the car, take it back into the guy's kitchen table, turn the radio on. If it worked, it was like, okay, we're flying this radio. Okay. These are unbelievable stories to people who build. I think it's worth retelling these stories because we don't want to forget these stories. But the interesting thing about these stories is 95% success rate in flying these satellites. How is that possible? So people started treating us. I mean, I got my first job in microspace because people just thought we, were, we knew something. Right? We knew something. We didn't know what we knew. You know what I mean? It was working. but. It's like you're born and your eyes work and your hands work and everything, but are you a genius because of that? I mean, you didn't build all that stuff, it just worked. So we were building these satellites, like one after another after another, launching them into space, and they worked. It was like, of course they work. They always worked, right? And it kind of, my contribution to all this was to figure, why is this working? Because I was working in the big space area where you kill yourself to try to get reliability and you have redundancy and you have all these very major individuals reviewing your programs and part selection and clean rooms and all that stuff, and they weren't doing any better. If anything, they were doing worse than AMSAT on reliability.